Uh, Roberto, we're going to um, uh, move on uh, right now for, for time's sake, and I wanted to thank you for uh, sharing that Davaso details with us. Um, our next presenter is uh, James Erickson. Uh, James, Jim is a uh, associate professor of reading at the University of Northern Colorado. Jim has collaborated with K through 12 teachers to simultaneously teach and do research on reading, writing, oral language in elementary and middle school. He has presented his work both nationally and internationally. His presentation this afternoon is entitled "When Seeing Interrupts Interpreting," and in just a moment we'll bring bring Jim up. Otherwise, uh, I'm hearing that I'm unmuted, and I'm going to go ahead and go forward. If, uh, if I have any issues with the audio, if someone would just quickly chat me, I would appreciate that. So uh, the basic overview of this presentation is that I'm going to bring forward the uh, illustrations of the nursery rhyme Humpty Dumpty as an example of how, uh, how illustrations become conventional. and uh, the way that that conventionality then impacts the relationship between text and image in illustrated works, and uh, moreover to talk about how that conventionality closes the text to interpretation. I've got three key methods that I've used with uh, young readers and even my uh, college uh, children's literature courses to reopen those texts that have been closed by illustration, and then the last of that will be extrapolating and expanding on uh, that process to talk about how it impacts uh, visual literacy in general. So uh, the first thing that I want you to do is that everybody that can hear me, I want you to answer the question that I put up on the board here. What is the first answer that comes to mind when I ask, what is Humpty Dumpty? A little pregnant pause there for you to answer that question. Did you say egg? I have about 99.9% .9 of responders that I've worked with on this that say that egg is the first thing that comes into their mind. Uh, I do have the occasional uh, uh, thinker uh, who comes in and says, well, I think it probably means something like a, a king who has lost his position as a king and so on. Uh, but usually uh, egg is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, now what I want you to do with me is to uh, look at the words I'll read those out loud. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. My question changes now. In the words, where does it say egg? And of course we can say that while the words obviously match the well-known illustration, the words are not telling us it has to be an egg. Uh, when we think egg and we read the words, we can see that there's a clear match there. But uh, we know that with a rhyme like Humpty Dumpty, that historically the rhyme existed possibly for hundreds of years before we ever saw Humpty Dumpty in illustration. So uh, this is a case where we've found over time that the conventionality of the illustration is actually uh, predetermining the meaning of, uh, of the words for people who are familiar with the illustration. If we went back into the 16 and 1700s, we would have a culture who did not have illustrated nursery rhyme books, uh, did not have, uh, have that, uh, that genre available to them in print, and that those people's approach to interpreting that rhyme may have been entirely different. And so the fact that that, that image uh, so finally determines uh, the, the interpretation of the words it closes off the opportunity for interpreting the words, and that uh, interpretive potential is something that I worked with uh, with the students over the years to see what, what would happen if we tried to reopen that rhyme for interpretation. So uh, one of the first things that I ask people to do with me, this is the first uh, technique for reopening a closed text, was uh, visualizing with the words alone. Uh, when I told people uh, that uh, just what, like I did with you a moment ago, that, uh, that it's not the words that are saying that Humpty Dumpty is an egg. What else could 
HumTDMDB if you just looked at the words alone. And students of mine, uh, second graders, these two responses came from. The uh, uh, first one uh, that I remember so uh, frequently is uh, one student said it was a watermelon. It could be a watermelon. And uh, when he illustrated that, he uh, had a watermelon sitting up on a wall and then a really gory picture of a watermelon smashed on the ground below. And in an interview, another second grader said, uh, Humpty Dumpty could be a clock. I know because I tried it. And then when he illustrated that for us, it had pictures of little cogs and wheels of a clock all over the floor and him trying madly to put those things back together. Uh, with that same group of, uh, of students, I had a, a second grader who was helping me just manage papers and interviews. After he'd heard several of these responses, he just turned to me and said, Humpty Dumpty could be anything as long as it's breakable. And that really is the, uh, the crux of this rhyme, is that it really is saying there's something that's breakable and irreparable, and that visualizing actually helps you to capture uh, that, that idea that the rhyme could be anything. Uh, the second thing that we did with, uh, with students was we actually did a historical inquiry. We wanted to think about when did that egg image become so strong and so conventional, and how did it become conventional that way, and, uh, and why did that happen? And I'm just bringing up a couple of images here for you. Uh, there's a fairly clear answer to this, and this is the point where uh, I spent a lot of time in library archives. Uh, I found every possible uh, nursery rhyme, Mother Goose type collection that I could and took as many color photocopies as I could. This all started back in the late 1990s, uh, so I some of the scanning and other technology was, was pretty difficult to use then, but, uh, but we did it anyway. We got color images of many of these, uh, these uh, illustrations of Humpty Dog. As we go back in time, we find that Maxfield Parrish, uh, the famous illustrator, is pretty much the linchpin in this, uh, in this conventionalization process. Uh, the Parrish illustration is the illustration on the left, which is a cover uh, from Life magazine in 1927. The illustration on the right is John Tenniel's uh, engraved illustration from uh, Alice's uh, Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Uh, that is from several decades earlier, uh, in the 1870s, in the 1880s, when those, uh, those editions came out. And so uh, what you can see is that, uh, is that by the 1920s, that uh, an extremely famous illustrator, uh, Maxfield Parrish, was quoting elements from John Tenniel's illustration. The key elements uh, that he's quoting are that you see that we have an egg-shaped man with arms and legs coming out of the egg shape. The face is right there on the egg shape. Uh, we have somebody who's dressed in a very spiffy manner with the collar and bow ties. This sort of dress approach to things is something that we see quoted uh, fairly frequently. And in answer to some of the questions, that, that process is there is that this process of quotation of a well-known uh, popular image is one of the ways that this convention begins to come into play. And it does uh, end up looking like the breadth of Ma Maxfield Parrish's celebrity uh, had a huge impact because in the gathering of images, I'll go to the next slide, uh, the Humpty Dumpty images after Maxfield Parrish remain almost constant, and uh, it does have variation in it, but if we look at this image, I'll bring three of these up. We can see that the key elements are being quoted repeatedly, and this should bear some resemblance to the egg person that you were probably imagining when I asked what is Humpty Dumpty, because uh, dozens and dozens of uh, illustrated Mother Goose collections that we scanned and, uh, and photocopied had these same elements. Uh, again, the round egg head and body all in one with arms and legs sticking out, uh, collars and bow ties, uh, all fairly frequent elements in there. So uh, 1927 is a pretty good date for us to say uh, Humpty Dumpty became conventional from that day on. And another reason we can uh, look at that time period is the time when it became conventional is that if we go before Parrish in that 1927 illustration, 
that those visual elements were not constant. So the first illustration we have is uh, by Kate Greenaway. And this is uh, pretty interesting. We have a child sitting on the wall, and uh, the uh, handwritten uh, lettering underneath just reads, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. It doesn't even carry through on the, the finality of, uh, of the rhyme. Uh, so a little bit dark. Uh, puts a child up there for us on the wall. Uh, same time period, uh, 1880s, uh, 1890s, we have uh, Walter Crane, who illustrates this for us. And I'm just going to emphasize on this And the illustration we're looking at is this one here. We have a hunchbacked Richard III, uh, who still does have this sort of uh, outline of an egg shape, uh, with uh, the head hunched down and the legs uh, and arms sticking out from the sides, but uh, definitely a very uh, different approach to, to depicting Humpty Dumpty. And finally, the... Dalziel brothers, who were engravers uh, for John Tenniel uh, in the late 1800s, gave us an egg man uh, with just the head as an egg and a uh, regular human body depicted uh, following out from that egg head. Uh, again, the, the overall tone as we look at these three illustrations is fairly dark, where if I push Back to the previous slide, we see that the, uh, the tone of the illustrations uh, later on tends to be uh, more whimsical and uh, comedic, uh, giving us something that's a little bit more appropriate for the nursery, where these uh, earlier illustrations from the 1800s did have a much darker tone. Uh, that brings us to, uh, through uh, to, in a historical inquiry, to the earliest known illustration of Humpty Dumpty. And this is where things really start to kind of open up. This is a fold-out toy book that was published by the uh, London publisher Tilton Bogue in 1843. And we see the, uh, these three interpretations involved in this rhyme that end up being corroborated by the OED's uh, historical sampling method. So I, I just direct your attention to the, uh, the cup on the left-hand side. Uh, when we look at the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, we find that the earliest reference to the term Humpty Dumpty that's available in print uh, tells us that it was a drink, uh, a mixed drink of brandy and ale that was very popular in the London area. And uh, by 1843, uh, over 150 to 200 years later, we see this element of a drink uh, still being in play in the earliest illustration. That element is not available in any of the later illustrations. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have the suggestion that this egg-shaped man is the one taking the drink, so the egg illustration is still there, uh, but that as he drinks, uh, he falls off the wall. This leads us to the, uh, the other uh, explanation from the Oxford English Dictionary, which is that after uh, a few decades of the popularity of the drink Humpty Dumpty, uh, that a person who was a drunkard uh, with that sort of uh, uh, tipsy, rotund profile uh, was called a Humpty Dumpty. Uh, so a person uh, who was, uh, had the red nose and, and was portly and was found uh, staggering out of the pub might have been uh, called by others Humpty Dumpty as he walked down the street. So uh, the uh, Oxford English Dictionary gives us all of these interpretations and suggests for us that all of those interpretations were part of popular knowledge about the rhyme uh, for at least this illustrator in 1843. But by the time we reached Maxfield Parish and John Tenniel moving up into the 20th century, uh, that popular understanding seems to have disappeared in favor of the standard egg image. And before I move on, I just have to note, since uh, I, I heard that we have uh, uh, an audience that includes a number of uh, librarians and archivists and so on, this uh, image, the Tilton Bogue uh, toy book from 1843, yeah, was, uh, was something I found in 1997 in the collection uh, 
the special collections at the Lilly Library in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, at Indiana University. Uh, at the time, uh, I had uh, the entire book photographed for me and put onto 35 millimeter slides, and it was quite a technological feat in the late 1990s for me to find someone uh, that had a slide scanner that I could use to get these uh, uh, slides made into uh, high quality scans for me. So uh, this is, uh, and this uh, scanning process that was all supported by a, a small grant from the Children's Literature Association in the at late 1990s. So uh, going back to the historical inquiry again in, in review, uh, it, it, uh, answering the question, the image could be conventional by 1927. It was several decades of process that had led up to that, that process of quoting a popular image uh, was, uh, was at, uh, at the root of that. And it happened because of popular saturation uh, with the Tennille, uh, Alice uh, through the looking glass, and moving up into Maxfield Parish's later depictions. And we find that illustrators after Parish were more or less obliged to use the most of the popular illustration. And that's a process that uh, I examined by talking to uh, illustrators uh, and uh, and other people who talked about the process of getting a nursery rhyme collection published, uh, where an editor and a publisher would uh, would consider uh, it uh, really obligatory for an illustrator to provide the conventional images that would help people recognize a nursery rhyme collection as uh, traditional literature. And the why question with historical inquiry, we were able to answer with uh, the, the history of the Mother Goose collection. Uh, that over time, that as Mother Goose collections appeared, that there was this pantheon of recognized characters, such as uh, Old Mother Hubbard and Old King Cole and Humpty Dumpty and Little Bo Peep, uh, who were the recognized cornerstone characters in illustration that actually identified uh, the genre of the Mother Goose nursery rhyme collection. Uh, there was another piece in the process of that conventionalization. Uh, as time passed from the, uh, from the 19th century into the 20th century, we saw that the genre was going through the process of domesticating and kind of uh, making cute uh, things that used to be uh, street rhymes, uh, pub songs, bar songs, drinking songs, uh, the songs that street vendors would sing as they were uh, peddling their wares in, uh, in uh, British streets and so on. And over time, uh, what we saw happening was that anything that was more adult and uh, dark uh, tended to be removed and replaced with something that just looked like uh, good, clean fun. So that idea of good, clean, fun uh, prompted me to dig in and get some less known rhymes out to people to see what they would do with them. Some of these less known rhymes uh, I culled from uh, uh, Peter and Iona Opie's book, The Oxford Dictionary of Nursery Rhymes, and also from James Hallowell's uh, collection from the 1840s, uh, right around the same time as that first illustration appeared. Uh, he published a volume called Popular Rhymes and Nursery Tales, and this is one of the ones that shows up frequently there. There was a man in our town, and he was wondrous wise. He jumped into a bramble bush and poked out both his eyes. And when he saw what he had done and thought his little brain, I'll jump into another one and poke them in again. Uh, and this is one of the rhymes that I brought into students and asked them to visualize, and they would discuss their visualizations with me, and also uh, make uh, make their own illustrations of various scenes uh, from this rhyme. And the kids were pretty imaginative, even with uh, stick figures. The idea of uh, getting your eyes poked out and then having them poked back in again was uh, pretty generative. So. Uh, Another less known rhyme uh, that was interesting for uh, visualization, uh, Dickory, Dickory Dare, the pig flew up in the air, the man in brown soon brought him down, Dickory, Dickory Dare. Uh, we had uh, students that got really engaged in this because it's so open-ended. Uh, the pig flew up in the air. Uh, we had uh, students who 
tries to answer the question of why would a pig be flying in the air? And of course, some drew the pig with wings, but others drew the pig being flown out of a slingshot or a cannon. Uh, and uh, uh, students also had various interpretations of how this man in brown might have gotten the pig out of the air. And uh, we had illustrations of butterfly nets and fishing poles and shotguns and other things that uh, were all involved in getting that pig down. And this process, uh, after talking about Humpty Dumpty, helped the students that I was working with to take an entire tradition, uh, an entire genre, and think about how visualization uh, was really the powerful way of reaching interpretation uh, with most of these rhymes. And looking at several rhymes that were not as conventionalized was an easy way to, to bring the power of visualization forward and to coach students to use that with this genre. So uh, not a lot of people spend a lot of time with nursery rhymes, so I'll just quickly uh, extrapolate here, and uh, then I'll get down to a couple of the questions that I see appearing over in the chat. So uh, texts getting close to interpretation. Uh, one of the other situations that I've seen where illustrations actually drive interpretation is the concept of the farm. Here's a, a cover from a recent book where we see all of the conventions at play. We expect a farm to have the uh, red barn and this whole menagerie of farm animals. And I've uh, noticed that many children, when we talk about farm, expect all of these things to be in play. And then they end up being surprised when we take them on a field trip to an actual working farm. And there's no red barn, and there are just a bunch of crops. Uh, no, uh, no farm animals, no red barn, no farmer in a straw hat. So uh, this is one situation where a, a, a cultural phenomenon has actually been driven by the conventional illustrations. Uh, understanding of farm life is, uh, is tricky to get to, and this next is start taking kids out and getting them on the illustration. Another interesting tradition, a traditional text that I've found that has been driven in many ways by the uh, illustration process is uh, the, uh, the Bible. Uh, and this particular illustration we can see the, uh, the story from the uh, book of Luke in the Bible and we see animals at a manger in a stable. What I've found by doing some of the same types of inquiry with this is that the words in the book of Luke never actually say stable. Uh, they say manger and when we look at the historical approach to this uh, particular passage, we find that it's just as likely that that manger was out of doors. Uh, and we still see that today, that in uh, many rural areas, that places where we give hay to animals are out of doors as well as inside shelter. And so this is another area where uh, conventionality over time has actually come to determine the text. Uh, the last situation where I'm seeing this, and I want to pull it forward, is in the idea of a hero. So I have here a, a few panels from uh, an old Spider-Man comic book where we have a fairly typical approach to presenting Peter Parker as the alter identity for Spider-Man. Uh, more recently, in the past uh, few years, we've actually had uh, what's been called the reboot of the Spider-Man series, uh, of the Spider-Man comic book. Uh, bringing back the hero as uh, uh, an African-American Latino uh, by the name of Miles Morales. Uh, and that uh, the concept of hero for a very long time was something that was bound by color and other, uh, and other uh, visualization uh, conventions. So each of those three approaches that were used uh, were ways that we used to reopen a closed canonical text and they, uh, each of those methods uh, coached us back into revisualization as a way of reinterpreting the words. Uh, the upshot is, is that we can see that conventionality is a historical process and I uh, want to emphasize that historical processes in visual literacy uh, are as important as many of the individual psychological and developmental processes that we might see and talk about, such as perception. Um, and visualization itself is a, uh, is a fairly uh, strong theme in the Journal of Visual Literacy and in the study of visual literacy. It's something that I like to see go forward. 
and that uh, finally that we're not only in the business of critiquing images, but uh, this process of making images and imagining is, uh, is fairly central to to what we do in studying visual literacy. I'm going to dig in and get some of these questions because you all have uh, started popping them up. Let's see. Back to normal non-drawing mode and get to where I can read all the questions. So the first question was uh, that uh, printed words are already overprivileged in U.S. classrooms when compared to visual. Uh, how does it help to emphasize cases where visuals are diminishing interpretation of printed text? Uh, uh, one of the reasons that I bring this up is because uh, we do have uh, areas of text that tend to be governed by convention and by canon. Uh, rather than being a, you know, a standalone type of text. So I brought up uh, several examples where we see that convention and canon driving things. It's especially true in traditional literature with fairy tales and folk tales, with uh, books like the Bible, uh, and with the nursery rhymes that we tend to see a convention dominate inside of a canon. So, uh, the next question, uh, favorite icons uh, like these are central to the popular knowledge of the traditional texts. Uh, we identify those texts because we recognize the icons and what are some of the alternatives in teaching and learning. We can't just make a popular image like Humpty Dumpty go away. Uh, and I think that's the, the place where, uh, where I'd like to bring in these uh, three methods, the idea of, uh, of revisualization is a way of breaking up the canon. Uh, and uh, since uh, we may have some uh, archivists and librarians in play, I'm just uh, recognizing that at the, the library at University of Northern Colorado that this is the type of uh, thing that can actually show up in a historical presentation at a library, uh, that a library's collection might uh, foreground historical images uh, and organize them in such a way that people are able to revisualize a text that's uh, conventional and canonical. And, uh, and that that type of approach in a display could provide a connection to critical, and view it, crit to critical viewing that could connect to a variety of curricula uh, across a campus. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are any further questions. Alright, I'm happy to uh, field any questions by, let's see, I'll just uh, skip ahead on my slide to a, an email. If any of you are interested in talking to me, I, I can uh, send you some of the materials that you might look at. And I'll just quickly also reference uh, the material that I was talking about today is also a lot of it available in uh, Volume 28 of JBL. Thank you.